Yeah, so you're gonna have this show, yeah. and you're gonna have the song. So it's like this like multimedia. Yep. M- oh, it's almost like multi meta multimedia experience, <laughs> right? Because you're distributing it not just over the internet, but you're distributing right. it, you know, over the decentralized internet and this Web three internet. And so it's this whole extra layer of awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's an amazing that's, way to that's, explain that it. That is a whole extra layer of awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first interview episode of the What Kind of Internet Do You Want series. Today, I'm chatting with Michael Casey and Jen Sanasi about the startup Streambed Media. Michael Casey is the new chief of content at Coindesk, and he's the chairman and co-founder of Streambed Media. He was previously a journalist at the Wall Street Journal. He is the author of five books, including The Age of Cryptocurrency and The Truth Machine. He's an educator and researcher at the MIT Media Lab and MIT Sloan School of Management, and he is a sought-after public speaker. I've had the pleasure of speaking on panels with him a few times, and I always know the discussion will be great when Michael is moderating. Jen Sanasi is the head of production at Streambed Media and the host of their first original series, Jam Lab. She is an experienced digital storyteller and is currently getting her MBA at the University of Toronto. Streambed Media is both a tool suite that enables creators to register, manage, market, and monetize their work, and a producer of original content. We recorded this interview last fall when Michael and Jen came to visit us in San Diego to plan how they would build their app on Open Index Protocol. They ended up hiring us at Alexandria Labs to build their first proof of concept app based on their designs. We just wrapped up development this week. It looks awesome and really demonstrates the power of the technology. One last thing before we begin, please hit the subscribe button and maybe even share this video series with your friends who believe in the freedom of the internet. Your support means a lot. So without further ado, very excited to have you both. Welcome to the What Kind of Internet Do You Want series. Yeah, thanks for having us, Amy. Thank you. Yeah. So I thought we would just jump into kind of Coindesk and what you're thinking about that, just to kind of get things started, because that's what everybody's talking about right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fun when you are the news. I much prefer to be sort of like writing and behind the scenes, but actually be the news is a little bit disturbing. But um, yeah, I mean, look, I'm really excited about this. Um, I, I think that uh, you know, Coindesk is in a pole position, of course, to take charge of the coverage of a really important phase in, in, in basically capitalism in the, in, in the economy, right? We are yeah. entering into an entirely new era, the era of digital assets, the era of decentralized finance, decentralized you know, capitalism, essentially. And the idea that uh, you know, there needs to be new, news publications and uh, outlets for discussing this and sort of driving the narrative around it. So in some respects, like the Wall Street Journal of that era is, is, the, is the aspiration here, right? Or the wired of the internet age, right? Yeah. So, so it's kind of exciting from the coverage side of it. Um, you know, we're gonna just, just building out that operation, looking you know, broadly at you know, the economic implications of this technology. Um, but also, I think I'm really excited by. Well, we're going to see this new chapter for CoinDesk now, right? right? I think I think, so I think both from the coverage side and also just from the business model. Like we're really looking at. I think it's just very important that that a company like CoinDesk is kind of Web 3.0 facing. Yes. Right? So what I mean by that, I mean you know it's all the stuff that you guys talk about. Right. Like, we're you know, all in the how, same How do we how do we protect yeah. users' privacy? How do we ensure that data is not something that we're exploiting? But at the same time, how do we use things like token Tokens and reward systems and new forms of engagement to build an entirely different business model. One that I think gives greater power to publishers and creators like CoinDesk, because hopefully we can create a model in which we can start to bypass the big bad behemoths, the Facebooks and the Googles in the middle. Absolutely. So you know, it, it's an, the nice thing about uh, this position really is, is there's a mandate for some experimentation uh, for for that's growth, wonderful. and that's the nice thing as well is that it dovetails with all the stuff I've been doing up until now. Totally. I mean, that's why I was so excited to have you as our first guest on the What Kind of Internet Do You Want series (laughs) because um, your whole career is really kind of a a statement about what kind of internet you want in some ways, you know, that you've built this conversation about all of the different aspects of how to make the web kind of live into the full dream for right. the web, right? Yeah. Because there's a lot of problems that we're seeing right huge, now. Huge, so yeah. 
I thought we would just talk a little bit about kind of first maybe the dream or first mm. maybe the problems, whichever mm. you want to talk to. Well, they kind first. of one, one leads with the other, right? So let's think yeah. about what in the uh, internet 1.0 era, yes. the popular narrative was about the internet, right? It was this wonderful open bazaar of ideas, essentially. It's, and it's and it, look, it, it has unlocked massive amounts of new information. Mm-hmm. And it has, in fact, you know, transformed society, not always for the better, but certainly in sort of some ways it has, um, because of the fact that the architecture allowed for information to flow uh, much more rapidly and at much lower cost. So we've mm-hmm. basically turned... Right, the internet was decentralized in its it, earliest it Absolutely, days. absolutely is. At, yeah. at that architecture, at the... At the you know, the data switch, the, the the packet switching, data data transfer layer, you know, decentralized. It well, was, well, but also in its community culture. Oh, you absolutely, were more absolutely. To participate, yes, right? yes. The culture and, was born of it, and so it was just. You know, and so the idea was like, and I think, what was the advantage to society? Mm-hmm. It, it's it's a similar concept that I think that we were, you know, people would talk about the role that the printing press played in sort of expanding information and access to information because absolutely. now it's not just that everybody could read a book. It's now. In the internet age, everybody can also publish, right? So, yeah. and everybody's a publisher. So, this seems like a really exciting idea that we're going to have uh, a, a, a much more level playing field for ideas, right? It's like a competitive and marketplace competitive of ideas. Bizarre of right? ideas, yeah. and the best ones will rise to the top, mm-hmm. and all will get us faster and better innovation as a result of that. Mm-hmm. So, fast forward to you know Internet 2.0 and the web era that then evolved, I suppose, into you know Web 2.0. We talk about the social media era, right? The plug and play, what like WYSIWYG era. Right. I, I felt like the beautiful era of the internet, right? right. When all oh, the graphic designers got involved, and so we got all the templates and everything looked better because that's 1.0. Yeah. Yeah, those those graphic design decisions were made by the developers. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right? All of a sudden, <laughs> but, but, but the problem is that that that's where money got involved, right? That's Which right. is cool. We needed the money we to pay for the pretty designs. Scale and it and right. make it convenient right. for the end we users. You know? But what? But we quite literally didn't figure out what to do with money itself. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. You know, if you were going to have e-commerce, if you were going to have any form of business on the on the web, suddenly we had this problem again. Hang on a second. This is a decentralized architecture. I don't know who you are and you don't know who are. So if we're going to do peer-to-peer value exchange mm-hmm. across the net, mm-hmm. we have a trust problem, mm-hmm. right? Which is the same problem that, that Bitcoin sought to solve, right? Mm-hmm. Um, how do I, in this decentralized environment, in a peer-to-peer basis, exchange value with somebody without relying on a trusted intermediary in the middle, right? Mm-hmm. So that's a problem that we now know we frame because of what Bitcoin has done, this framing of this problem. But if you think about it, since we didn't have a solution, that's really in some respects where the big central intermediaries emerged Absolutely. out of, right? Because Absolutely. it turns out the data is essentially a currency. It's certainly a form of value that, yeah. that, 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 that we had to give up and exchange. And yes. so now that we're in an exchanging environment, Who's going to control that? But these intermediaries, and so I think the the wall gardens, the uh, the large kind of network effects driven data aggregation systems that that really emerged out of the moment when we started putting money and value into the internet because we kind of had to. We didn't have a, an alternative solution. But the problem is that you know that control over the data was also control over the content was also control over access. That's right. So it meant that that curation was in the hands of these algorithms that neither you or I had any control over. So if I'm trying to communicate with you, right, and, and you're one of my readers in a publishing environment. Totally. I follow you I'm, I'm, and I want to get your Right, content. and I want to yeah. get straight to you. Yeah. Um, and, and, and we do so in the interest of this great global bazaar of ideas so that I'm competing with Jan and her, her you know, we, we're out to try to get your attention. Yeah, yeah. Um, in, in an open peer-to-peer situation, that, that would be fine. But unfortunately, now we have this curator in the middle that's just saying a second, you know what, I'm going to set the terms as to who gets to read Michael's content mm-hmm. and Jen's content. I'm going to determine that. So we're not competing mm-hmm. for the interests of our audience. We're not, our ideas are not in an open level playing field mm-hmm. of the kind that we would think. Instead, we're competing for the love of an algorithm over which we have no control. Mm-hmm. So Facebook or Google, that's the competition is for their functionality and mm-hmm. their system mm-hmm. rather than for the eyeballs. Of things. So we've totally distorted the internet, right? Yes. We've, we've gone from this dream of right. an open architectural system for, for, for better information dissemination and and ideation and innovation to one where 
we're all trying to serve the interests of something that we don't even know how it functions. It's a secret algorithm, <laughs> and it's right? Changing, right? And it's, so changing it's changing its own interests. We can't chase it. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so, true. I mean, I think that's, that's just a, a complete destruction of, of the dream. I right. mean, it's really about the incentives and well, how the incentives of the way that that system has worked mm-hmm. have driven things to kind of people to seek how to capture value yep. where they can. Yep. And because they weren't able to capture it doing certain kinds of things. Yeah. Right. And, and think of um, now with these social media intermediaries becoming the big driver of it, um, the, the incentive systems built in some respects around dopamine releases. So how do we get a rise? How do we get people excited or angry? Whatever it is, that's going to move content around. And we're yeah. pe- teaching ourselves that that's the way to uh, win what the algorithm wants us to do. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, on that note, though, um, I, one of the stories I like to tell to sort of give a, a, just another broader indication of how the incentives are all completely misaligned was this um, this BuzzFeed article. It was a brilliant bit of reporting uh, in 2016. And they, it, they encountered these kids in Macedonia who had their own website and they were making money through Google Sense, sure. just to add, add, add Google sense, AdSense. Facebook. Right. Whatever, it was right? just, you know, eyeballs being directed back to the to the mm-hmm. website and they were collecting, you know, a small amount of money, but quite mm-hmm. a lot in Macedonia at the mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. And they figured out that the way to do this was just to make stuff up. Mm-hmm. Um, it didn't matter because it was 2016. Like it was in the middle of the clickbait. extreme clickbait in the election cycle. Yeah. Right. And. The thing is, Facebook's algorithm was enabling that because Facebook's algorithm has, as there's a great web, Wall Street Journal piece on this called Red, red State, Blue State, or red, red Feed, Blue Feed. And it shows that if you happen to be of a liberal mind or you happen to be of a conservative mind, you're going to see a completely different news feed mm-hmm. thanks to the algorithm and the curation algorithm that, mm-hmm. that, that Facebook's running. Facebook calls it like audiences, and that's valuable to Facebook because it can create a market around that for its own platform advertisers, mm-hmm. right? Not for the advertisers of the content, but for on platform advertisers they love the stickiness of these audiences mm-hmm. because what happens is the dopamine release of an of an angry conservative or a happy liberal or an angry liberal whatever it is mm-hmm. is going to keep sharing it's going to be this confirmation bias all the time they're always right. just going to compete um uh, resharing things as a result and it, and so these kids in macedonia were writing stories like donald trump endorsed by pope francis uh-huh. completely and utterly untrue right <laughs> um but it was you know, like music to the ears of a particular type of voter sitting in this particular like audience that Facebook algorithm had created. And they were just getting thousands and thousands of shares and retweets and directing massive amounts of traffic back to the Macedonian website. And these kids were making money. They were making AdSense on the Making website. AdSense by, by they'd figured out how to game the algorithm, right? Now, think about this. Um, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, I mean, people love to hate mainstream media, but the fact is they spend large amounts of money trying as best as they can to get the story right or right. to get the you know, to get some level of balance into it, to get two sides of the story. There'll be layers of editorial staff involved. There's a you know, there's, a, there's editor-in-chief, there's a copy editor, there's various other people trying so to get the story right. Massive amount of money gets spent to try to actually get it right. Yes. But you will be out-competed in that environment by people who are just making shit up. So it's like that, how do you balance the, the the conflict between like open access, everybody being able to publish something, mm-hmm. right? But then the weight, the reputation of people that are publishing higher value content. We're, we don't have that on the web today. That's really kind of the friction that you're. That, that, that's a huge. Right that's a huge problem. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I I, I don't know. It, we kind of do in some ways because we have well, the legacy kind of memory of these institutions and right. their reputations. Yeah. But we don't have an internet wide system for me to say, you know what, this person consistently publishes like really thoughtful, yeah. really quality journalism and this site or or you know, public key or whatever it is mm-hmm. that's identifying this person doesn't, you mm-hmm. know, there's no way for us to tell that to one another. One of the ways I like to think about it too is like um um, in the in the theoretical future where I have children, because my friends all have children now, mm-hmm. what I would do about about moderating their content and how cool would it be if other moms and I could start like a channel where we officially curated all of the content in it and we said, I deem these appropriate for my five mm-hmm. and unders or whatever it is, right? And all of my friends do that too. So now I have this trusted circle mm-hmm. of people putting content in so I don't have to watch every like mind-numbing child show there is to decide if I think it's appropriate. My friends are helping me out in this endeavor, right? Mm-hmm. It's that kind of filtering that you're really talking about that would 
Yeah, I, th I think there's huge opportunities in the in the Web 3.0 era, right? Yeah. Where where people are able to um, you know form alliances together. You can think of let's look like a mini DAO, basically what that is. You know, a decentralized yeah. autonomous organization yeah. that's that's functioning around a set of rules. Um, and you and know, we, maybe making money for doing. Maybe we'll be making money. Incentive. Yeah, so yeah. A good segue to bring Jen into the conversation sure. because last night when we were barbecuing, we were talking about how it's really hard to monetize creativity, I guess, for lack of a better way to say it, right? And so as a creative person, I know I've really struggled with this question too. It's like, what do you do? You know, how do you navigate your life and how do you make money as a creative person? And I think that that's a question as old as time, but given how broken the web has become in this kind of peak web 2.0 era that we're in right now, everybody's right. freaking out because it's breaking so fast. Yeah. How do you do it at all if you're a creator? I mean, you always imagine a creative as this like struggling artist, starving on the street, like sleeping on people's couches. And it is really happening like that, I guess, in a more modern way for people who are creating content, especially um, online. I mean, with these changing algorithms, you can have an audience of, let's say, 50,000 followers, and you're trying to access these followers with, with your content. But then when you look at who's viewing your content, you're only you're only allowed to reach, to reach out to like a thousand people. So how are our creatives ever going to get to a point where they're able to utilize this this system to their benefit and, and reach their audiences? They're just being like it's like it's like climbing two steps and being pushed back three. Exactly. Right. Exactly. It's so frustrating. And so that for me is like why I get so lit up about this yeah. because it's about sovereignty for each one of us, yes, right? Yeah. And even for the data itself, yeah. right? Or for the information itself, you know, information should be free. Free as in freedom, not free as in financial, But it does cost money to make content. You should yeah. pay for your content, pay your creators that you love, right? So tell us a little bit about the show that you're gonna be making. Okay, so Jam Lab is the very first show coming out of Streambed Studios. So that is attached to Streambed Media, which I'll let Michael talk about after I explain the show. Yeah. Um, but basically, we want to empower creators. We want to give the power back to the people. Oh, we, sovereignty. Yeah. yeah. We we just want to in, encourage creators to create and be in in an environment where they're allowed to explore that, but also to reach their fans and the people who are interested in what they're doing. So. We're working with music, which is really amazing. I love every single genre of music, except for, I think, maybe country fans are going to hate me for saying this country, but there oh, will yeah. be country artists on the show. <laughs> there will be. We're I'm fully old enough open to admit that I love country. Mind. You love country? <laughs> I need you to recommend some artists for the show afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I grew up in the country, kind of, so, you know, it's okay. part of my Then I really hope you didn't take offense. No, no, no. Oh, God, no. No, no, no. I wasn't even brave enough to admit it for most of my life because you're, like, not allowed to like country music or something. No, but. you're allowed. <laughs> <laughs> So we are empowering artists. So we're looking to find up and coming artists from every single different genre you can think of who have a following in, whether that be in their community, in their genre, maybe they have a following for um, their specific sense of fashion or, or their political views. They have a, a following in something. Yeah. And we're juxtaposing one artist against another. So we're telling the story about cr creativity and the story about technology, bringing people together who might not have thought that they would have been able to interact. Mm -hmm. Bef it's like mashups. Remember Glee? Exactly. Yes, mash that show? Love that show. <laughs> the word mashup is in our pilot episode, by the way. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes. It's a collision. We as got well. a little sneak peek of it last you night. You did. Say it's very good. I can't wait for the whole series. It's going to be really fun. Yes. Yeah. So we're pairing these genre, these artists up with songwriters and producers and allowing them to create in an environment that will help them tell their stories in a way that they haven't been able to tell them before. And we'll get 10 songs out of it and 10 episodes that everyone And so they have some sort changed. of like compressed, like make a song in 24 hours or is it something kind of like that? Yeah. I mean, we, we'll have to massage some of it along the way, yeah. but, they, <laughs> but the viewers going to be, yes, my God, they didn't win yeah, but, but, exactly. look, the pilot that you saw 
yes, that's pretty much what happened. These guys really? went into the room and they just, you know, they did some post-production work and we talked about that. Sure. But really the guts of the song was put down God, there and then. It was such a fun room to <clears throat> be It was in. fun. Electric, it was a lot of yeah. fun. They were great guys. You yeah. Know, like some yeah, old, that that old, old rockers mm-hmm. met a, a younger uh, singer-songwriter producer and they put them together and were there. We found some magic, which was great. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So you're going to have this show yeah. and you're going to have the song. So it's like this, like, multimedia. Yep. Oh, it's almost like multi meta multimedia experience right because you're distributing it not just over the internet but you're distributing right. it you know over the decentralized internet and this web 3 internet and so it's this whole extra layer of awesome <laughs> that's an amazing that's, way to that's, explain that it. Is a whole extra layer of awesome, yeah. I mean, look, one of the reasons why Jam Lab, we think, is a great way to test out Streambed's technology. So, Streambed yeah, so is working Streambed. in, you know, a lot. I know working a lot of it, on OIP. Working on OIP. <laughs> we're working at, we are building first. on top of our Open Index Protocol. And we are, you know, basically registering each piece of content that we produce, uh, you know, in, into the, the Open Index. And, and from that, building smart contracts and so forth but one of the things that's that we think is going to emerge out of these new ideas again is about engaging audience right. how do we engage the audience if we can essentially map their relationship with the content itself and how can we reward them so think about musicians and fans of musicians so we're thinking cool. about nfts non-fungible tokens Absolutely. that you can get to reward people for yes. engaging in it so it's a way to again bypass the central you're not taking them off twitter or off facebook or off google uh, youtube for that matter but you are able to reach them differently it's like if you're a fan and you're helping me you're engaging i can reward you in some yeah. way right and brands can get involved and it starts to just bring a new realm of engagement in a new realm of value, really, mm-hmm. for the for the creator and the user to start, you know, communicating. And so much again. transparency and sovereignty, like yeah. we've been talking exactly. about. Exactly, it's all about it's all about sovereignty. Happens. Both sides, and you know, there's yeah. opt-in options for different people to what you might receive, what what data you might share out. I think this is this this idea of sovereignty and empowerment is really at the heart of. of, of Which brings us kind of to the beginning so, of our discussion when we were talking about incentives, because really, what's broken, right, is that the. Web 2 is all about the attention economy, mm-hmm. is what you, you called it, right? Yeah, yeah. And now we're moving toward, I guess, what so the I, I want to call, I wanna, I wanna call it the engagement economy, right? I think yeah. that, you know, it, attention is, it is a really um, powerful concept because it's the one resource that we know will always be finite, right? We only have 24 hours we and seven all days. So all, hours, all of us, that's all we have. I know, because the, the, economy of abundance is, is very much where we're at we're, yeah. we're able to actually manufacture proteins now out of you know out of nothing uh, essentially you yeah. know g- gene splicing you know the world the physical world is now almost being as, as Mark Andreessen said you know like eaten by software <laughs> so so that means that there's this abundance to the economy but the yeah. one thing that is still yeah. absolutely is attention, right? So <clears throat> attention is a really interesting way to think about both the solution and the problem, right? At the moment, everybody's competing for this one thing, mm-hmm. these eyeballs. I need your eyeballs. And since you've only got to find out about it, how do I get you mm-hmm. and not this person to look mm-hmm. at it? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but under the structure of that attention economy right now, it is um, really, again, driven by these algorithms in the middle. What I really want to do is figure out how do we go for more than just competing for your eyeballs, but connecting with you, yes. right? engaging yes. with you. So building these communities, that right? Are like and, and, and the thing about that that's I think really valuable because attention is actually a resource that we're providing, right? So the this idea that you know Absolutely. you are not you are not Facebook's uh, consumer, you are Facebook's product, right? Right. You're. You know, there's some, some people argue, for example, that, that, that UBI, Universal Basic Income, whether you believe or not in that, uh-huh. um, it, it could be conceived of as some sort of inherent payment that, that all of us as participants in the digital media economy should be rewarded for because mm-hmm. we're always giving up this finite resource. You're providing resource. your attention. You're providing your attention. Right. So we've seen, you know, we know that the, the brave... Uh, browsers, sure, the, you know, basic yeah, attention basic token attention is built around people. some of these ideas as well, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's attention is always a key part of the metrics and a key part of the way we, we, we are imagining this economy going forward. But I think the end goal is something more. It's again Absolutely. engagement and connection, and and ultimately getting to the heart of why we ever communicate in the first place, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. It's it's the social the dynamics. Marketplace of ideas, the right. exchange. It's about ideas. like yeah. you know we make we create 
values. We create economies through yes. collaboration, through yes. human beings coming together. Yes. And, and communication and information is at the heart of that. So models that encourage engagement and collaboration, that's where we want to see the incentives aligned, right? That, yes. That's where the, the, the ideal vision of a, of, a, of a really constructive internet comes from as far as I'm concerned. Well, I think that is a great place to leave it. This was a fantastic chat. Thank you guys both so much for being on the first show. Thanks to everybody for watching. We'll see you on the next one. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and the like button. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Make the internet free again. <laughs> you can find Michael on Twitter at Mike J. Casey and Jen at Jen Sanasi. And for more about Streambed, go to streambedmedia.com. They have been fantastic partners, and we are proud to be working with them to make the internet better for creators. We have more interview episodes in the works with other similarly awesome people working for the freedom of the internet. And if you have a suggestion for someone we should speak with, please give us a shout on Twitter at OpenIndexProto. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.